Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host. And my guest today is Kaleopi. Hi, Kaleopi. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for being on my channel. So I, um, you have two different brands of yarn. Why I two? Do. Why two? Um, <laughs> so Anzula is officially 20 years old this year, which is super cool. And Anzula is a luxury yarn company, is very... Um, branded as luxury, uh, there's certain things that we don't do, like uh, that are off brand for us. And I wanted to have a yarn company that I could have more fun with. And I actually started thinking about this in 2012, uh, but for a bunch of different reasons, we didn't launch it. And so now we were ready to launch it in um, 2020 and COVID happened. So that got postponed. And now we, uh, we have soft launched it, and I'm actually going to be launching it for the first time in public this weekend at Red, Red Alder, which is going to be two months ago, I guess, once this airs. But um, it, it, um, Anzula doesn't have anything that is discontinued, so all of our colors just keep collecting. Our yarns don't discontinue unless something happens with the mill or the source. Uh, mod yarns is more fun and funky and is a lot more playful with its names. The yarn I'm knitting with right now is called Little in the Middle <laughs> and it's a thick and thin yarn. Uh, we have a new yarn coming out that's a chenille called Touch Me and um, Anzula is more classy and is wouldn't have such, wouldn't go in that direction. Right. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about how it all started. So 20 years ago, what happened that day when you decided to go into business? Well, um, I was actually a hobby crocheter and we, uh, we, I, I used the royal we because there's lots of us. Back then it was just me. So uh, if I say we, I apologize. I'm just so used to it. Uh, I was a crocheter. I was uh, 19 turning 20. I had guardianship of my kid sister. I was going to school full time and working full time. And I would take my breaks to go study at a coffee shop and I would take my crocheting with me. And people started buying what I was making at the coffee shop. And I decided that I could actually have a hobby business doing this, doing crocheted goods. And uh, for my 21st birthday, I decided to learn to spin yarn and that quickly became part of the hobby business. I started selling my, uh, my hand spun yarn and uh, basically when it became the crocheting and the spinning together, that's when Anzula came into effect. And um, I created the name Anzula out of uh, the word azul, which is blue in Spanish. And when I was uh, playing with the word and playing with my different um, language dictionaries because I really love different languages. Uh, I was trying to create something that was fun and um, I just started adding sounds to Azul and came up with Anzula. <laughs> and there were no other businesses that were named Anzula at the time, so I decided to go with it. Right. Well, was it your vision from the beginning that you're going to concentrate on luxury yarns? Yes, um, I was a um, I was a crocheter, and crocheters often um, get labeled as interested in more inexpensive yarns and um, just cheaper quality of fibers. And I immediately was drawn to camels and alpaca and yak and just all these fun different fibers. And so. Uh, I, I threw that tagline in so people would know right away that it was it was a higher class crochet, right. and um, it it's it's worked for us. In well, what, I mean, was was it difficult at any point to like start that as a business, and be, because it's a higher price point, right? Like, is it more difficult to find customers? Well, I think I looked out because I was living in the Bay Area at the time. And I was doing mostly farmers markets and craft fairs. And um, I 
we are used to buying full size skeins. And if I were to make a skein of yarn that was hand spun and it was a full size skein, um, it would have been multiple hundreds of dollars. And up there, people wanted to spend like 30 to $60 for a skein of yarn. And so I made um, tiny skeins that were uh, like 30 to 60 yards each and sold them for about 30, 15 to $30. And people bought it because of the price point. Um, had I done the same thing in Fresno where I live now, it's a different market and people wouldn't have bought in that realm. Right. So um, it was fortunate that I was living where I was when I was growing my company. Well, do you think it's like luck or do you think it's your business genius that led you this way? Uh, there's definitely luck and there's definitely lots of hard work. Um, I hustle as hard as I can to stay relevant and to stay, um, stay on the pulse of what yarn is important and what yarns and fibers are, are doing. Um, I also do what I love. And so because I have such a strong passion for it, I think that speaks for the, for the success of the company. Um, I've also had amazing people that have helped me along the way that I, in, in 2008, I was um, teaching and I lost my full-time position doing what I was doing. And up until that point, Anzula had been a hobby business. And in Fresno at the time where I moved back to, there were no jobs that were paying more than like minimum wage. And so uh, I decided to see if I could make this hobby business grow into something bigger. And um, we, I, everybody I knew was unemployed and they were able to help me. And we went to a bunch of different events and we were able to, to grow that way. Are all the same people with you now? Like, do you keep this, the same people or you have, like, how did the we became we? Um, well, in 2008, uh, it was mostly me with a lot of uh, volunteer help. And then in 2010, I hired my first person. And uh, there was a little bit of turnover between 2010 and 2012. And in 2012, I hired my first manager, Charlie, and she was with me all the way up into um, the middle of the pandemic and then had some personal in reasons that she needed to step away. But um, she's still a very good friend and I love her dearly. Um, but she was with me for almost 10 years. Uh, the team, the rest of the team I have, I think the shortest amount anybody's been here is five years. Uh, Gabby, Carmel, and Becca, they are all amazing. And so now it's a team of four of us. Right. Um, at one point there were 10 of us and um, it just kind of ebbed and flowed with, uh, with the, the economy. Right. Well, I mean, you went from being by yourself to like hiring a lot of people. Was it difficult for you to like let go of the control of every Absolutely. step of the way? Absolutely. Um, there's a book, uh, Who Moved My Cheese? And I actually haven't read it, but the, uh, that phrase always stuck with me. And when I first hired Charlie, my manager, um, it was incredibly difficult because I, I have, if you see my desk right now, it's messy chaos. I know where everything is, but to somebody else, it needs desperately to be organized. And she would come in and organize, which was definitely needed. <laughs> but I didn't know where my cheese was. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was hard giving up certain controls. But uh, the, the thing I've always done in hiring was uh, hire for my weakest point. Um, and so when I brought Charlie in, I am terrible at answering emails. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but in, when you're emailing, you're talking to Becca, right? Because I, emails will sit and I'll mean to get to it, but I'm terrible at it. Um, and when Charlie came in, I think there were over a thousand emails <laughs> just pending. Um, so I, I 
I think my greatest strength is knowing my weaknesses and bringing people on that could fill those weaknesses. So right now you have over 100, 140 colors for the Azula. Mm -hmm. What was that journey like? How many colors did you start with? How did you add those colors? Like, how did you decide on what else to add? We started with 40 colors and um, they were basically, we, we went, uh, at the time it was me and a friend who were gonna be business partners with Anzula and she ended up um, deciding to go in a different direction. But um, we started with just the rainbow and picking colors from the vendor that we buy the dyes from, filling out the rainbow that, that pleased us. And then as I would add colors, a lot of times it would be uh, inspiration from the world around me. Uh, there was a movie that I was watching that uh, the, I saw the actor's shirt and I was like, that has to be a color. And I instantly knew the recipe um, and that's temperance. And it's one of our best selling colors, even though it's like uh, almost, not an acid green, but it's one of those yellow greens that are less popular, but because we love it so much, it's more popular. <laughs> um, so a lot of it is inspiration of the world around me and uh, people that inspire me. The, uh, there are colors that I've named, like Olivia is named for my niece. Um, Aurora is named for Belle in, um, not Belle, um, named for Aurora in Sleeping Beauty. And um, key lime is key lime pie. <laughs> things we love. I mean, do you um, ever have pro like trouble coming up with new names? The names is actually the hardest part. Coming up with colors is fun. Coming up with a name is, can be incredibly difficult uh, because we have so many things. There's a lot of good names that we fill in or um, oftentimes when we're naming something, we look to see if there's something already um, on Ravelry that is named that because we try not to be some, be, uh, we don't want, we were the first squishy on Ravelry and now there's a few others, but um, Touch Me, the yarn that I just created, I wanted to make sure there weren't any others. And that when I looked, there was actually um, four Touch Me's on Ravelry, but it's all from a company that no longer exists. Right. So now it's okay to do. Do you compare yourself with other dyers? Do you like always check what else is on the market, who is doing what, or do you have your own vision for your business and you're just sticking to it? For me, it's not about competition. It's about if a friend of mine, Amanda Jarvis, owns LL Yarns. If I see a shop that has her yarn in it, I know that's a good fit for my, my yarns also. Um, another friend of mine is Oink. Uh, pigments. It's, we complement each other. Uh, and if somebody's interested in my yarn, they're most likely going to be interested in their yarns too. Mm -hmm. It's, it's about, there's a phrase, um, high tides raises all boats. We're all in this together. And when I thrive, hopefully you thrive too. Well, when you started with, when you were learning how to dye yarn, was it difficult to find sources of how to learn? Um, I got my first source actually out of a magazine. I um, can't remember the name of the fiber magazine, but it was one of the fiber magazines back in the 2000s. And um, she actually, I, I called her up because it was back when you had phone numbers and everything <laughs> in the magazines. And so I called her and she happened to be in LA and it was, uh, the company is no longer around, but it was Piece of Yarn. And uh, she was able to let me come meet with her in her, uh, she was running her business out of her home, just like I was. And um, that was how I got my first fiber sourcing. Uh, I've, I've been lucky along the way. Sometimes my mills have found me, sometimes I've found them. And uh, I, it, it all just, the, the pieces fall into place and I feel like I've been very fortunate. Well, how do you approach mills? Like, because you're very particular about the kind of fiber you're looking for and how you want it to be spun. Like, how did you start with working with mills? The, I will seek out a mill sometimes and they will, I will say what I'm looking for 
and they'll send me some fiber samples and then I'll tell them the twist I'm looking for and then they'll they'll give me they'll sometimes do up a few twists or say these are some yarns that we already do do you like this twist and it'll work or it won't work um, there have been many mills that I've worked with and we've developed yarns and then for whatever reason the relationship didn't work out and that's always so disappointing because it takes years to develop a yarn with a mill right and um there was one year that we had worked for two to three years on our uh, superwash merino and tussa silk yarns and we had four that we were launching this in the same year again we'd been working on them for two or three years we hadn't shared it with anybody that same year everybody came out with marine superwash merino and tussa silk and none of us were using the same mills none of us were talking to each other about what we'd been creating it's just sometimes these things happen <laughs> Right. When you see, like when you're at the festival or something and you see other yarn from other dyers, is that sort of inspiration? Or is oh, yeah. it like, okay, they I'm do it, I'm not going to do that. I never ever want to be what somebody else is doing, but I often buy other people's yarn because it's gorgeous and I want to knit with it. Um, I, I, I'm often knitting with yarn that's not mine. I just happen to be knitting with yarn that's mine today. Um, I'm making a, a giant cowl. <laughs> it's gonna be huge. But when and, you work, do you you work also with like you you work with a lot of stores, right? You yeah. do wholesale. So is it difficult to find stores that will sign you up? I haven't had difficulty. Um, I I can't speak as to why that's been, but um, there are I I when I'm searching for shops, there are shops that don't have any hand dyed yarn in them and almost always that's not going to be a good fit for us and then there are shops that only have hand dyed and that's almost always a good fit for us um, i'll email a shop first introducing myself and then i'll call them and um, they'll either meet with me or they won't and i i don't take any of it personally because who knows what their circumstances are well, is it difficult for you, like, not to take it personally? Is it difficult to deal with that rejection? Because, like, I'm sure there's, like, days when nothing goes your way. There are days when there have, during the pandemic, it's been particularly difficult because you'll call 10 shops and find out that all of them have closed. And that's more heartbreaking for me, for, for everybody, and that the shop didn't succeed. Um, but it's a shop, I, I reach out to shops and ask them how our yarn is doing, if they have already carried us. Um, they may not be able to order from us right now because yarn isn't moving very quickly for a lot of shops, but I will send them a, a garment trunk show to try to help move, move the yarn. Um, I'll do, um, a meeting like this with the yarn shop so that we can brainstorm ideas to help move yarn a lot, move yarn faster. Um, it's not always about getting an order now. It's about how can we help the yarn that you have sell well so that you can then order more in the future. Right. Was there like anybody who returned the orders? Because of Thankfully, no. Um, there have been people that, that had to postpone orders um, but nobody returned orders that I've never, knock on wood, <laughs> I've never experienced that. I mean, is there, like, was COVID, like, really difficult for you because Absolutely. of that? Absolutely. Um, we had to take out a major loan. Um, the SBA was doing loans for businesses, and uh, I have, I have a phenomenal team, and I've done everything in my power to not have to lay them off. Um, and so we've leaned heavily on the loan because shops haven't been able to order as they have in the past. Right. So um, I'm I'm glad that things are. Oh, it's it's a it's a balancing act with keeping people healthy and keeping the economy going, and um, we just try to make the best decisions for all of us. Was, and in the midst of it, you coming up with the second. Mm -hmm. uh, brand well the, the brand had been in fully formed we actually had had the yarn all of it existed 
two years leading up to the yarn, the yarn company launching, um, because we had to develop the colors, develop the dye technique and everything. Um, we had, we would, dye, we would pick up a line of yarn, but we wanted to have all three yarns that we were launching together. So um, it was disappointing to not be able to launch the yarn company publicly, but you roll with the tide that you have. Right. I mean, are you like in general, when you think about yourself, are you a very positive person? Like, are you an optimist? Do you always see the silver lining or do you I, have to deal with like the whole uncertainty of it? I think I am probably annoyingly an opt optimist. <laughs> uh, there, were, I've, there have been times that uh, I remember my mom growing up would sometimes be like, we don't need to, you don't need to spin the positive on this. <laughs> So yeah, I do try to lean that way, but there are times that you just want to hide under the covers too. Right. I mean, do you have a dream for the business? Do you have ambitions for this business? Do you? Oh, absolutely. This is my retirement plan. <laughs> um, I actually just turned 40 yesterday. Um, and obviously this is going to be two months later, but um, Happy birthday. <laughs> um, I just turned 40 and uh, I, I don't think I could have imagined 20 years ago, where the yarn is, where the yarn company is now. Uh, we are in stores around the world, and that is just crazy cool. <laughs> I mean, do you plan to retire ever, or do you see yourself dying yarn until the I last hope day? To retire. Um, I, I don't hope to retire Anzula. I think, I hope Anzula will keep going through the times, but um, I hope to retire from, from um, running Anzula. Is it difficult to keep the dye lots exact, like the colors exact same? No, we have a very specific recipe and we have a very specific way that we dye so that uh, everything's consistent as much as is possible. Um, there is, of course, water changes throughout the year. Um, the temperature and humidity can sometimes affect things. But as much as possible, our dye lots are fairly consistent. I once had a yarn shop call me and said, uh, you know, I picked up the un one skein of Arizona from you at TNA, and I just got my dye lot, uh, that I, the full dye lot of it, and I was expecting the worst because it's not often <laughs> people call you to compliment you. But um, she said, it is identical. There is no, I cannot tell the difference between the skein I have and the six that you just sent me. And I was just like, yes. <laughs> I mean, that's so rare. Like I must tell you, because I was doing a show. Somebody asked me to test a show. And I asked, well, how much yarn do I need for that show? And they said two skeins. So I bought two skeins, ran out of it. It wasn't even the center of the show. So I ordered another two skeins they came like a little bit off color. I continued, ran out again, needed another skein and it came completely different color. So it was like three very distinct stripes, you know? That's and then the company funny. ran out of business, so. Oh no, that's so sad. Um, we have um, between six and 10 colors that I say have a lot of personality. They, from dye lot to dye lot, are going to be different. Um, shiitake, periwinkle, cocoa, uh, off the top of my head, opal. Um, they, no matter what we do, every time we dye it, it's different. And it's just kind of fun. It's the fun thing about those yarn, those colorways. But everything else we do uh, is incredibly consistent. And it's something that I pride our, when I was creating Anzula as a wholesale company, which is completely different than a retail company, right. um, we prior when we were just doing retail, I was doing all kinds of colors, um, multicolored yarn, uh, speckled yarn. The most difficult thing with that though, is it's hard to replicate. And I wanted to create a yarn that was a beautiful palette for stitches to be created. And so I decided I wanted to do semi-solid colorways so that 
the skein and the yarn still had a lot of character when you're knitting it and it kept your interest, but it wasn't distracting from the stitches. And um, while also doing that, being consistent from dye lot to dye lot. And um, for a very long time, we took samples off of every single skein we dyed to make sure that when we dyed blueberry, it was the same as two years later. Uh, and it wasn't changing over time. Um, it was a when, lot. When, of when you think about the new color, do you have to go to your palette and see what's missing there? Like, how do you come up with the new? Sometimes, um, like I, there was one day when I was looking at the palette and realized we have 20 greens and only three purples. And purple, to my two favorite colors are orange and purple. And sometimes because it's your favorite, you try not to do too much of it. And I realized I had gone too far in that direction. <laughs> so uh, I, I developed a few more purples to go into the palette and fill that out. Um, I ended up with so many greens because I was trying to do the perfect green. And I, I personally still haven't found that perfect green, but I love all of our different greens. Well, when you like look at some design, right? Like you go on Instagram, let's say you scroll and you see, I don't know, Stephen West publishing his new show. Do you immediately think in your colors? Absolutely, yeah. He, his palettes are phenomenal. And uh, I wish we could do all of our palettes in, in those bright, crazy colors. Um, unfortunately, that's not gonna move well in all shops, but um, we're, we're very regularly inspired by what designers are doing in the now. Right, well, when you think about what's gonna move, going for expensive luxury yarns is probably not the way to go like because Absolutely. you can sell much more of a sock merino than camel why did you decide to stick with luxury fibers because i just love it so much um i will buy a sock yarn that is just has that touch to it that makes my fingers sing much quicker than I'll buy a $5 skein of yarn just because it's $5. Um, but that means that everything I, I do takes time. I'm not gonna go through a, a, a sock yarn in one day. I'll be knitting on that for probably a month. Right. Uh, a pair of socks takes 40 hours. So if I were knitting on it constantly, it would take me a week. But um, it's, it's putting value into what you're creating and treasuring that. Uh, there are times that I can't afford to buy my own yarn and, and so I don't. And then there's times that I, I can't afford and I save up my pennies and go and get a fancy skein. What's, the most, expensive, what's the most expensive yarn you sell? The most expensive is probably our 100% cashmere, um, which is actually um, uh, a little, in the skein, it doesn't sound like it's very expensive. And um, I'm gonna pull to it because we sell it in 50 gram skeins instead of 100 gram skeins so right. that it's more, um, it's easier for the person to buy. Um, if it were a 100 gram skein, it would be um, almost $100. Right. But as a 50 gram skein, it's $47. Um, the, the most expensive fiber I've ever touched was Vicuna. And that is from um, South America and is just, it's like heaven. You just touch it. And I don't know if you've ever touched it before, but it, it is softer than cashmere. Right. Now, I mean, like, I, I'm just like dreaming about having a couple of them as pets. <laughs> Oh, I know. They, they look so cuddly. They're so cute. Tiny little alpacas. <laughs> I mean, so when you like think about the next fiber you're going to get, like, are you done with getting new fibers? You already like oh, have gosh. every large luxury fiber. Well, um, so one of my favorite yarns that we had was called Oasis. It was camel and silk. 
and <clears throat> it was a gorgeous yarn soft light um very a, a very lofty fiber spin and uh unfortunately the source disappeared and we haven't been able to find uh, a comparable source we were able to uh, find somebody that we could get the same fiber from but instead of being 36 dollars a skein it was going to be 50 something dollars a skein and that's just not something that the market can bear uh, so hopefully one day i will find another camel yarn that i that will be uh, in a price point that we can move um, but who knows there's so many wonderful fibers out there i'm always dreaming up new spins uh new mixes um i have one of my mills i i they're always saying well what are you wanting new and i said these are the fibers if you find something with these blends in this price point and it's it's that balancing act of i the the sweet the sweet price point is about in the 30 dollar realm um much more than that and it's hard for the shop to move and it's hard for the consumer to be able to buy um and so we just we try to stay there we have a couple of yarns that are in the 40 dollar price point and um we're fortunate that people love them uh, but we we try to work within what people's budgets can also bear right What's uh, Instagram for you, for the company? Like, how do you treat it? Um, it's it's fun. It's where so we get to work in color all day, and we get to take what we're what we're in the middle of and give you a snapshot of that. Uh, we do something we call Wiggle Wednesday, and it's whatever we're pulling out of the pot and show it <laughs> dancing around in the pot. Um, it's it's where we get to have more of a personal relationship with. Do you know your customers? Like, do you do people tag you in in their projects? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Are um, you surprised to see how far your yarn travels? It's wonderful to see that. I remember when we first got on Instagram, and um, I'd heard that it was this fun new thing, but I wasn't really. Uh, I was heavier into Twitter at the time, and I was shocked to see how many people had already tagged in Zula. They weren't even on there yet. <laughs> it's wonderful so what's in plans for this year what's happening what's new what's about to happen what are you looking forward to well we're doing a lot more um events out in the world um as long as everything stays at this kind of safer point that we're in right now um we're we're trying we're going out into we're doing more retail events um and that's just for the short term because we're not a retail company, we're a wholesale company. But um, just to, to keep us all going, we're doing that. Um, we are, we have some really cool yarns that I've been, that I've had waiting in the wings for a couple of years because stuff wasn't moving. So it wasn't a good time to launch a new yarn, but um, I have some really cool stuff I can't wait to, to bring out for you guys. Um, do you have like events for your employees that you do some social stuff outside of work or is it is it like strictly business or it's like sisterhood oh it's totally a sisterhood um today i brought bought everybody lunch because we're packing the van for an event that i leave for uh in a couple of days and um we're all working really hard and so i bought everybody lunch and we just hung out and chatted um with, it's a family when you're not working, when you're not dyeing yarn, what else you're into? Um, I love, I, so I travel a lot for the company, but I also love traveling for fun. Uh, my boyfriend and I just went to Big Sur and camped there for the weekend. Um, the weekend before that, we'd gone up to the Sequoias and, um, and hiked around. Uh, I love being out in nature. Um, I would spend every day at the beach if I could. <laughs> <laughs> is um, that where you find your like sources for inspiration like for colors for like oh absolutely things? yeah i love being out in nature and even walking the neighborhood and seeing what people are doing in their yards you get inspired with color um i almost always have a notebook with me because i jot things down when something comes to mind i'm like oh i want to make sure i do this i mean is there like any funny story of inspiration 
Um, I, I think the, the funniest one for me was when I was watching that, that movie and I, that, the, the color just came to me when I saw her shirt. I was like, this has to be on yarn. I have to make this color. Um, and I was shocked. I, I tried a bunch of different ways to dye it, to create the color. Cause I was like, for sure, the, the first recipe isn't going to be just try, just right, but it was. And I, I tweaked it a few other ways. And I was like, nope, the, the, the recipe that came to my mind was the right one. Um, there's a lot of intuition for it, for me. Um, I wasn't, I didn't go to school for color. I was, I'm never, I've never been trained in color. So uh, it's, it's all been intuition and, um, and play. Like, are you ever surprised by what you create that you like? Oh, constantly. I'm, I'm floored that Anzula is in yarn shops all around the world. Um, I, I still get giddy when our shop in Australia shares a new thing they're doing with our yarn. Um, it's, I'm just as excited now as I was the first day. I mean, are there like ever days when you're like, what was I thinking? I have this responsibility, the life of all these people, like they're alive. Absolutely, it's and terrifying. Everything. Yeah, because um, I, I, I take a lot of pride in keeping my team employed. Um, it's scary that uh, we're, I don't know if we're technically in a recession or a depression or what right now, but it's, it's scary that there's a chance that I might have to lay some people off at some point. And I really hope I don't, and I'm going to work incredibly hard to do everything I can to keep everybody employed, but that's, that's the reality. And um, I, take, I take employing people very, very seriously. Um, they're, they're, there was a time that I would, was getting panic attacks because I have their quality of life in the palm of my hand and one wrong choice and I could really screw up their lives. And I don't want to mess up their lives. I mean, is that like really heavy weight to carry? Because at the end of the day, it's still your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they, technically they can walk away and get another job. Um, and in theory, I could walk away and get another job too, but none of us want that. We all love what we do. We have a perfect chemistry right now going with the four of us and none of us want, uh, want to have to go in a different direction. I mean, like back in your childhood, right? Like back when you just started crocheting, did you ever envision that you're gonna get into, make it, turn it into a business and like never, your dream? Never. As a kid, I actually planned on going into politics. <laughs> <laughs> I, from the time I was seven years old, I, was, I would go around saying, I'm gonna be the first woman president. And um, after going to college and studying politics, I was like, okay, that's not gonna be my cup of tea, but... Oh. Um, you are the president of your own company. Technically, yes, I am. <laughs> well, thank you so very much for being my guest today. I really enjoyed chatting with you and getting to know more about you and your yarn and your team. Thank you. It's really and, nice talking with you. And happiest of birthdays. So all the best wishes. Thank you. <laughs> 40.